Okay, so to begin with today, I'll introduce our second keynote speaker, who is Joao Verissimo from the uh, University of Potsdam. Joao is an expert in morphology and morphological processing, and he examines how morphology can tell us about language processing and linguistic representation in native and non-native speakers. He received his PhD from the University of Essex working on Portuguese morphological processing with Harold Clarsen, before then moving um, to, to Lisbon where he carried out a, po uh, a postdoc, I believe in the Department of Psychology, and he also was a visiting researcher at Georgetown University, um, collaborating with Michael Ullman. He's then spent some time um, in Potsdam in Germany. He first moved to the Potsdam Research Institute in Multilingualism, where he continued to work with Harold Clausen and other, other colleagues in, in PRIM. And since then, he stayed in, in Potsdam and has been lecturing in the Department of Linguistics and now works on the Limits of Variability in Language um, project working in Traven Vassar's lab. And soon he'll be moving again. I understand he's moving back home to Portugal, where he'll be taking up an assistant professorship in, at the University of Lisbon in the School of Arts and Humanities. So Joao's work spans psycholinguistics and multilingualism, and he's published in many of the top journals in these different fields. This includes Cognition, Journal of Memory and Language, Language Acquisition, Linguistic Approaches to Bilingualism, and Bilingualism, Language and Cognition, where he also works as a statistics advisor. In Joao's talk today, I understand that he'll present a synthesis of his recent research on native and non-native um, morphological processing and what this tells us about the graded nature of non-nativeness in, um, in, uh, when we look at morphology. So with that, I will um, move uh, spotlight Joao for his talk where he'll um, discuss how second language morphological processing reveals the differentiation of the language system. So Joao, I will, you should now be on if you want to share your slides. Oh, I'll unmute you. Can you can you hear me and see these slides? Well, I'm going to turn it up a little bit, maybe. Turn up the volume. Yeah. Yes, that's okay. That's okay. Is this okay? Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> can I start? Yeah. Go for it. Great. Okay, thank you so much for having me at COM 2020. Thank you so much for that introduction, Ian. <clears throat> uh, as you said, the topic of this talk will be how um, a series of studies that we've conducted um, on the, the processing of morphology in a second language can um, provide insights not only about L1 versus L2 differences uh, and bilingualism, but also about the, essentially about the architecture of the language system. <clears throat> um, a lot of these studies are about the comparison between a native speaker group and about um, the comparison between a native speaker group and a, a second language speaker group. Specifically, second language speakers that acquired the target language later in life. That is not uh, in childhood, but later in life. And what our studies have been revealing is that even for highly proficient speakers uh, of a second language, we still find some uh, interesting differences when it comes to processing measures. So as long as the tasks tap into the real-time processing of language, there are uh, interesting differences to be found between native processing and uh, non-native processing. <clears throat> Of course, as we all know, native and non-native acquisition um, displays some striking differences uh, that, that jump at us. Uh, it is more or less clear that if a language is acquired later in life rather than from birth, this comes with certain challenges. And in general, if a language is acquired later, then attainment in whatever linguistic measures or performance or ultimate attainment in a language tends to be lower. Um, there is also more individual variation in the end state that is attained. <clears throat> that is, individuals tend to be <clears throat> very different from one another in bilingual populations. Uh, 
Um, and it's also widely recognized that there are many external factors that play into this. It could be socioeconomic factors, it could be um, psychological factors, motivation and emotional factors, it could be uh, the type of exposure to a second language, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, and these factors appear to have more of a role than one looks at uh, native language acquisition and native language uh, processing which are generally thought to be more governed by what one could call endogenous factors. <clears throat> uh, one of the early studies to point this out by Johnson and Newport back in 1989 uh, showed that uh, if you gave L2 speakers, uh, in this case, it's a grammaticality judgment task, then their performance in this grammaticality judgment task was very sensitive to age of acquisition. That is, it was very sensitive to um, at what point in life, at what age, these L2 speakers had started acquiring their second language. This was done, if I'm not mistaken, with um, Chinese speakers that had arrived in the United States at different ages. So we can see that as AOA, age of arrival or age of acquisition becomes higher, older, um, then performance tends to decrease in this task. But also I'd like to point out, as you can see in the second panel, that there is also greater heterogeneity, greater variability and differences amongst speakers um, if age of acquisition is late, a point that I'll come back to in this talk. <laughs> So the question becomes, how can we account for this? The greater variation in bilinguals and specifically late learners and also the generally lower attainment or particular challenges that L2 speakers face, how can we explain them? And that's um, really the tough question. <clears throat> Broadly speaking, we could say that there are two very broad types of answers. Uh, for the purposes of exposition, I'm, I'm Kind of setting up this as very extreme positions. Of course, one could have all sorts of intermediate positions in the middle, and, and we could have different types of specific models. I'm trying to characterize these two general approaches. In one approach, we could say that second language processing and first language processing, or second language acquisition and first language acquisition, uh, essentially entail qualitatively similar mechanisms. Perhaps L2 processing is slower, perhaps it is more resource demanding, um, but these are essentially general differences between L2 and L1. And the sources of those differences, the explanation for those differences can be attributed to things like lower exposure in a second language than in a first language, perhaps the influence of the L1, uh, or even the fact that uh, there is bilingualism in two, langu two languages in the minds of these speakers instead uh, of one. Also things like socioeconomic factors, education, etc. And this is one class of accounts. Importantly, this type of accounts also tends to emphasize that the differences between L1 and L2 uh, acquisition, knowledge and processing tend to be gradient rather than all or none. That is, depending on these kinds of factors, depending on the amount of exposure, etc., it is possible to become more or less native-like in a second language. <clears throat> Another very different class of accounts would be that there are indeed fundamental differences in second language processing. Uh, there is something very special about speaking a second language versus a native language. Uh, and the, the ultimate reason for that is that there may be some sort of partial access to the mechanisms of language acquisition, especially when language is acquired later in life. There is, there is some, some sort of loss, so to speak, uh, of the ability to learn um, in a native-like way certain aspects of the language system. These types of accounts tend to emphasize that there are selective differences between L1 and L2. That is, um, certain parts of the linguistic system appear to be more susceptible to this loss, uh, and thus those parts are the ones that are more challenging to L2 speakers. <clears throat> what parts would those be? 
if we actually look at that um, Johnson and Newport task that I presented to you, very early study on these matters, this grammaticality judgment task that they gave their participants <coughs> Um, ask the participants to give judgments on a number of different um, phenomena. And as you can see from that description, these are all very grammatical phenomena in nature. We have a lot of morphology and especially inflectional morphology, a lot of function words, some complex syntax as well, um, um, such as WH questions, etc. cetera. Um, <clears throat> and studies such as these um, led to the, to the hypothesis, to the possibility that there are certain parts of language that are indeed much more susceptible to this uh, loss and to these difficulties in an L2. The broad domains that have been, been proposed have been things like syntax versus semantics. Of course, this is an extremely broad notion and we know that the full story cannot be like that. Um, but as a first approximation, it is interesting to note that many difficulties that L2 speakers face or many um, markers of non-native processing show up in the domain of syntax rather than lexicon or semantics. Specifically for complex and more abstract aspects of syntactic structure, <clears throat> within the domain of morphology, it has also been proposed that the combination of morphemes into complex words instead, for example, of lexical storage of full word forms may be um, particularly susceptible to, uh, to this loss that one could find in, in late learners. Very generally speaking, if we wanted to characterize this with a single sentence, we could say that the grammatical or more formal aspects of language are the good candidates for uh, pronounced L1 versus L2 differences. <clears throat> It's precisely with this kind of guideline in mind that we developed a series of studies that use morphology and the domain of morphology as a test case for this general notion of opposing grammar, essentially, and the more syntactic and morphosyntactic aspects of language to um, the lexical and storage-based parts of language. We've been using this contrast between inflection and derivational morphology because even though these are two types of morphology that obviously share a lot of characteristics, both inflection and derivation create complex words, but they are two types of uh, operations that seem to have very different characteristics. So inflectional operations, things like he runs, so that S at the end of he runs, is often determined by the syntactic context. In this case, we can have subject verb agreement. Um, inflection tends to be productive, transparent, obligatory. It tends to occur on the outside of derivation. That is, it's the, the, the last few morphemes that you get that attach to already derived forms. Uh, more importantly, inflection uh, expresses these very abstract morphosyntactic features, things like tense, number, person, gender, etc. Derivational morphology would be something like creating runner from the verb run. This is independent of the grammatical context. It doesn't really matter what position this occurs on in a sentence. The important point here is that if you attach ER to run, you can get a change in meaning or even a change in syntactic category of the stem. So it can now be a noun, uh, an agentive noun instead of a verb. Derivation also displays all sorts of lexical characteristics in nature. It's a lot less predictable. Um, it shows uh, semantic, um, some sort of semantic differences and lack of semantic transparency with regard to their bases, et cetera, et cetera. One way of formalizing these differences in linguistic theory would be that we are dealing, in fact, with two different types of linguistic objects and maybe two different types of rules in the morphological grammar. One would be rules that create forms out of lexical entries, and that's why we have run, runs, running, and ran. These are essentially forms for the same lexical entry, and their point is that they express morphosyntax, so we could call them uh, morphosyntactic operations. On the other hand, this mapping between run and runner 
would actually be a Marshall lexical operation. We can create a full lexical entry, a novel word form from run by applying this derivational rule. And this derived form can then, because it's a word in its own right, can then also have its own inflectional paradigm. That's why we can have things like runner and runners, which is a plural. Uh, <clears throat> and so this led many linguistic uh, theories to recognize these two components of the morphological grammar. This would be the more formal way of looking at it. In general, we could just say, like Hef Boy has uh, mentioned, that word formation, like derivation and compounding, seems to be more, seems to have more of a lexical nature, whereas morphological inflection actually has a syntactic flavor. We're trying to map between syntax and form, and that's what inflection is doing. <clears throat> So we've contrasted inflection and derivation in a number of studies with groups of L2 speakers in comparison with groups of native speakers. <clears throat> and in all these studies, we made use of the priming paradigm. The priming paradigm is when we detect and measure the effect of processing a prime word on the processing of a target word. The participant's task is to make um, a response to the target word, but then we manipulate the primes so that we can detect the effect of the prime on the target. A priming effect is always a difference between responses, response times, whatever it may be, accuracy, ERP components, but it's always a difference between responses in two conditions. We can have a related prime and an unrelated prime. For example, a morphologically related prime versus an unrelated prime. So for example, we can compare responses to run after the presentation of runner compared to an unrelated word such as teacher run. Or for example, we could detect the influence of scandal, processing scandal on the task and the response made to scan. In this case, this would be a purely orthographic relationship. Scandal scan overlap in letters, and that would be an orthographic relationship. Runner run would be morphological priming. Runner and run share a base and share the same stem. In this case, we're dealing with derivational priming, as I've mentioned before. <clears throat> the particular type of priming that we've used in all these studies is mask priming, in which the prime words are presented very briefly, only for 50 milliseconds. There's a link there. I'm going to share the slides. And if you click that link, you can see a demonstration of this in Ken Foster's website. Basically, the primes are presented below the, the, the awareness threshold. Participants in general, many participants are not even aware that they've seen any prime word whatsoever. Um, and very, very few participants are able to actually read the words that are presented for, short, for such short durations. But we do find measurable effects and detectable effects. Essentially, we're giving this information to participants in the form of prime words, um, hacking into their brains, so to speak, without them actually being aware of even seeing these prime words. The task that we used in all these studies is the lexical decision task. Participants are simply asked to decide whether the target word is a, is a word or not, give a yes or no response. Yes, this is a word I know versus not. And then we measure the response times to this task, uh, which serves as an index of how long it takes to recognize a word. <clears throat> Why do we like mass priming so much? It seems that mass priming taps into morphological structure, and that's what's very interesting about this technique. If we give people the prime jumped and then they need to recognize jump, they will be faster at recognizing jump after seeing jumped than after seeing something else like pizza uh, before jump. But importantly, in the mass priming paradigm, we generally get very small or absent effects, both of semantic and orthographic relatedness between words. So if you have doctor priming nurse, which are very related in meaning, we find almost no effects in the mass priming paradigm. If we have scandal priming scan, we find almost no effects in the mass priming paradigm in native speakers. And this is essentially the reason why people who are interested in morphology are basically in love with the mass priming paradigm. We essentially discovered a task that seems to give some sort of privileged window 
into the processing of morphological structure and the, the processing of the constituent structure of a complex word. Further evidence for that comes from studies in which people are presented with what are called pseudo-derived primes. These are examples like corner priming corn. Corner is a pseudo-derived word because it doesn't really have a morphological relationship with corn. However, because er is a suffix in English, uh, it appears that this word is actually decomposed into its constituents in the course of processing. And for a brief period of time, corn is actually accessed as if it was a possible stem of corner. Remember, like I said before, this doesn't occur for orthographic, purely orthographic relatedness, like scandal scan. And so you need to have this kind of morphological affix in order to trigger priming uh, when we have words priming words. Um, and that's why we care so much about this task. Essentially, priming effects in this task can serve as a kind of a diagnostic for uh, the application of morphological rules for a process of decomposition of complex words into their constituents, at least in the visual domain. All these experiments are done in the visual domain, and so there is probably a lot of interactions between these morphological rules and processes to do uh, with reading and that are specific to reading. <clears throat> when we look at the studies in morphological priming in L2 groups and specifically with the mask priming paradigm, we actually see a lot of empirical discrepancies. Different studies have found different things. Uh, possible reasons for that is that there is a lot of variation across items. Words are simply different from one another. There is a lot of variation across participants, and this is especially the case in L2 populations. There also seems to be a lot of variation across um, experiments. Some experiments find certain effects. Other experiments, even done with the same materials, as long as you change the sample of subject, may, may sometimes yield uh, different experimental results. We've been trying to tackle these different sources of variation. We've been trying to measure these different sources of variation and also to um, implement measures that allow us to deal with these different sources of variation. In order to deal with the fact that words come with their own characteristics and show different effects in uh, all of the studies that I'm presenting, we make sure that we're all priming, always priming the same target word. So we're contrasting inflectional and derived primes, inflected and derived primes, and we have inflected and derived primes on the same target word. So this would be something like runner priming run and runs priming run. You could have, uh, so the third person, um, as well as a derivation priming the same target. <clears throat> To deal with by subject variation, we've been trying to estimate the role of age of acquisition as a possible variable that uh, modulates uh, the performance of individual participants. Uh, and we've been trying to use um, more uh, sophisticated statistical methods that allow us to actually estimate individual differences and variability across participants, as well as across items and across trials. And to deal with bi-experiment variation, we've been um, conducting meta-analysis of this phenomenon, as well uh, as also conducting uh, pre-registered studies in which we decide a priori on all the analysis that we're going to do for a given experiment. <clears throat> Hopefully, by looking at this from these different angles and implementing these different strategies, we can get a more clear picture of the empirical patterns in L2 masked morphological priming. The studies that I'm presenting you now uh, are these four studies. The first one contrasting uh, morphological priming in L1 versus L2 groups. The second study, which is a meta-analysis of L2 morphological priming with the mask priming paradigm. The third study in which we examined age of acquisition effects in a population of Turkish German bilinguals. And then a fourth study in which we're making use of um, what are called distributional models, um, statistical models that allow us to model um, variability that is caused by the different priming effects. 
for the first study, this was actually led by Gunnar Jakob, which, uh, who is uh, actually presenting in the next uh, session. We contrasted a group of German native speakers with a group of um, L2 speakers of German with a Russian L1. They were highly proficient and immersed speakers living in Germany for many years uh, and that use German on a daily basis. As I said before, in this experiment, we have both an inflected prime and the derived prime priming the very same target word. So we have this prime displayed only for 50 milliseconds, and then we had a participle form or a nominalization priming the same verb target, as well as appropriate semantic and orthographic control conditions to ensure that whatever effects we got were morphological in nature rather than semantic or orthographic. What we obtained in that first study <coughs> where we made use of this experimental paradigm was, as you can see here, remember that these are response times uh, in a lexical decision task, was that in the L1 group of native speakers, we found priming for both inflected and derived forms. That is, if we present an inflected form of the verb or a derived form from the same verb as primes, then we get faster response times, uh, so uh, smaller RTs, than when we present a control prime. And when we did exactly the same materials with the group of L2 speakers, what we found is that the inflected effect was much smaller. It was closer to the control condition and the derived effect was much more pronounced. And so there was a significant difference between inflection and derivation in the L2 group. There was a significant difference between derivational and inflectional priming in the L2 group, but not in the native speaker group. So derivational priming was robust in the group of second language speakers, but inflectional priming is, uh, was much smaller in this uh, particular study. <clears throat> Uh, this was the first indication that indeed these processes of decomposing complex words uh, in L2 may be um, not fully functioning, so to speak, for the domain specifically of the decomposition of inflected forms, but may actually be native-like in nature for the domain of processing derived forms. Recently, we've made use of uh, mixed effects regression models and other statistical techniques to try and pinpoint the variation across subjects in these effects. So this data from this study has been reanalyzed. And what we found, you can see that on the leftmost panel, each row there is a particular subject. And we can see the estimated effect for each uh, subject's amount of priming. And then what we see in the middle panel is the amount of derivational priming by subject. Each row is exactly the same subject. Uh, and then finally on the third panel, we have this participant's response in the unrelated condition. So that's simply whether they're slow or fast. And what we found in this analysis is that the amount of variability in inflectional priming is greater by subject, much more than for derivational priming. Essentially, these statistical models are suggesting that derivational priming is similar across subjects, across L2 speakers. They all can be estimated to show more or less the same amount of derivational priming, but there are substantial differences in inflectional priming. Some people actually show large amounts of priming that may be native-like. Others may actually show inhibition effects and some sort of confusion from the presence of an inflected form. Um, this kind of analysis then suggests that indeed uh, derivational priming may be more native-like in nature in the sense that every subject is uh, attaining the same kind of processing when it comes to derived forms, but there's substantial inter-individual variation when it comes to the processing of inflection. <clears throat> 
In a second study, what we've done, because as I mentioned before, there are substantial empirical discrepancies in this literature, what we've done is to try and aggregate all the studies that had been done in L2 masked morphological priming and to use this statistical technique of meta-analysis to try and estimate the average effect in this uh, L2, in L2 populations. So specifically, we're trying to estimate the average priming effect in milliseconds. So again, the priming effect is a difference comparing a related versus an unrelated morphological prime. Uh, and we are doing this across studies and studies are weighted by their sample size. So studies that had more speakers, more participants contribute more to the estimation of this average effect. <clears throat> We had a number of inclusion criteria. Uh, importantly, all these studies used the same experimental task, different materials, of course, and they all had one group of L2 speakers and one group of L1 speakers. And so we can really see how the same materials are processed and what effects they generate in the two groups, native and non-native groups. We obtained the total of 25 uh, L2 effect size, as well as corresponding L1 groups from our uh, review of the literature. We examined a number of moderators, a number of variables that may play into priming effects. Uh, you can see a number of moderators there. Importantly, the only one that had a clear effect, a clear significant effect was precisely morphological relationship whether we are dealing with inflectional priming or with derivational priming. As you can see here in this forest plot, the top panel is the studies on inflection. Each row is one particular study with its effect in milliseconds represented by the little circle. The bottom panel shows the same thing, but for studies on derivational priming. And what we see, this is the average effect, is this black polygon at the bottom. What we see, these are the L2 groups. What we see is a very small eight millisecond average effect across these L2 studies. But for derivation, we find a 39 millisecond effect uh, across studies on derivational priming. And so we have a very clear contrast in the L2 between very small or absent priming for inflectional priming but clear and robust priming for derivational priming. Also of interest, when we do the same thing for the L1 group, which are the little gray polygons there, we actually find very similar priming magnitudes for inflection and derivation in the L1. That is 34 milliseconds versus 38 milliseconds. This is another visualization in which you can directly plot L2 priming, uh, L1 priming against L2 priming. In the domain of inflection, as we can see, all these little balls, each one is a study, <clears throat> is underneath that blue line, which means that all of these studies have found larger priming effects for L1 than for L2 uh, in a pairwise basis. But when we do the same visualization for derivation, what we see is that the studies cluster around this blue line that is, some studies for find more derivational priming in L1 than L2, and others find the reverse. Uh, in conclusion, in general, across this literature, at least when we conducted this analysis, there are some recent studies that came out uh, and some good studies that show inflectional priming in L2. I'm remembering uh, uh, an ERP study, I think, by Caitlin Coughlin, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and, and this analysis was done before some of the more recent studies came out. Uh, but in general, there seems to be a clear pattern in this literature in which L1 speakers show morphological priming across the board. L2 speakers show small or absent inflectional priming, but robust derivational priming. Sorry, well, uh, you have 10 minutes. Thank you. Also of interest, um, when we do the same thing, a meta-analysis for the orthographic conditions in L2, what we find is that in L1, as I mentioned to you before, the mass priming paradigm is generally insensitive to orthographic relationships when words are priming words. But in L2, as you can see by this black polygon here, we actually find a bit of orthographic priming in the L2. And that's another difference that plays into 
the, the different results and that um, and that shows the, nat the non-native likeness of L2 processing of complex words. <clears throat> Specifically, the pattern of results that I've been arguing for and that we've seen in a bunch of studies now are that we get more derivation than inflectional priming. And this seems to be a morphological difference in the L2. But there are other patterns that can be shown across studies. Uh, some studies show priming across the board for orthographic relationships, inflectional relationships, and derivational relationships. Other studies may actually show a pattern that is native-like in nature. So inflectional and derivational priming, and those are more than orthographic priming. So it is possible that the different patterns show up depending on whatever sample we're dealing with. In most of our studies, we've been finding the first pattern, and sometimes we also obtain orthographic priming in the L2. What's important here to notice is that this is not arbitrary, right? Uh, it's not like every study is finding something uh, weird and uninterpretable. We get these clear patterns that uh, e either reveal these morphological natures or show the orthographic nature, or perhaps in certain samples, perhaps particularly with very proficient L2 speakers, the native-like pattern can emerge as well in L2. The question then becomes, how can we explain these L1 versus L2 differences? We have done a study uh, estimating um, uh, age of acquisition effects in these priming effects. Uh, and essentially, we were trying to ask if there is anything resembling a critical or sensitive period for the acquisition of inflection, an optimal age at which language can be learned, such that then whatever we find in the priming task resembles native-like processing. We use the same materials as in the L1 versus L2 study that I presented to you before, but now we ran this experiment on a large sample of L1 Turkish speakers that are Turkish-German bilinguals. And importantly, these speakers had a wide range of age of acquisition of German. Some of them were simultaneous bilinguals, learning German and Turkish from birth, and others learned German much later in life in their 20s, etc. Importantly, all participants were bilingual, so they differ in their age of acquisition, but they are, they are all speakers of Turkish and German. And we made use of particular statistical analysis that was trying to identify the shape of the effect of age of acquisition on morphological priming. Specifically, we made use of regression with breakpoints. And the picture that emerged from those analyses was this. For derivational priming, which is this dashed line, we saw that age of acquisition essentially played no role. It doesn't really matter whether language is learned from birth, both Turkish and German, if you're a simultaneous bilingual, or if you acquire language at age 18 or 20, etc. more or less a stable amount of derivational priming is, is present. However, for inflection, we found evidence of a breakpoint there was a particular point in this regression line where an effect of age of acquisition started. Specifically, between the ages, be, between the ages of zero and five, so if language had been acquired either from birth up until age five, we got native-like priming effect. That is priming for inflection and no evidence of age of acquisition effect. During that window, people essentially behave like native speakers with regards to this task. However, if they acquired language later in life, that is then an effect of age of acquisition, such that the later the second language is acquired, then the lower the inflectional priming effect. And we interpreted these results as evidence for what can be termed a sensitive period for the acquisition of inflection. And perhaps if language is acquired during this sensitive period, and if indeed the morphological grammar looks the same as that of a native speaker, then years later, we can find the same priming effect in this task. If not, we actually see the non-native likeness emerging from age five onwards. <clears throat> five minutes now, please. Thank you. Uh, finally, in the last study, we've been trying to take forward this notion of how we can estimate the variability between speakers and the variability between responses 
in our experimental task, given that variability is a hallmark of bilingual language processing. Our hypothesis so far has been that inflected primes in particular may be associated with more variable responses in L2, perhaps across subjects, across items, across trials, more so than derived uh, primes. <clears throat> We've conducted an experiment recently with 69 L2 speakers of English. Again, mass priming experiment using exactly the same type of design as before. So we have surfer derivation priming surf. We have surfed inflection priming surf against the control condition, in this case, valuer surf. And in this study, we were specifically interested in estimating priming effects both on the mean of responses, but also on the variability or the standard deviation of responses. And what we found in this study was indeed morphological priming for both inflected and derived primes. So in this study, we didn't actually obtain that difference that I've been telling you about with lower priming for inflection in L2 than derivation. Um, Unfortunately, we didn't have an orthographic control condition in this study, and so it is possible that the priming that we see here in both conditions is more orthographic in nature due to the sharing of letters than, uh, than native-like morphological processing. But importantly, what we found was also an effect of the type of priming on the standard deviation or the variability of responses. This is in a log millisecond scale, but what the results showed or what our statistical models uh, estimated was that presenting a morphological prime like a derived prime slightly increased the variability of responses. But then if we presented an inflected prime, surfed priming surf, then we got a larger and more clear and significant effect on the variability of responses. So even though inflectional and derived primes actually behave the same with regards to the mean effects, uh, the mean response times, they actually behave differently with regards to the variability. Specifically, inflectional priming produces an increase in variability. One way of explaining this is perhaps that there is a certain lack of efficiency in processing inflected forms in L2. Perhaps in some trials, whoops, Perhaps in some trials, the benefits of an inflected prime is stronger than in others, depending on how much the prime is truly morphological processed, and this may lead to more heterogeneous responses. <clears throat> how can we explain this whole thing in the four studies? Generally speaking, if there is less priming for inflection than derivation, and if there are more variable responses for inflection than for derivation, we uh, assume that there is less reliance on decomposition of complex forms. This doesn't mean that these speakers don't know this form. They can use these forms and produce them and comprehend them, and they know that surfed is the past tense of surf. The question is, are they actually in processing, decomposing surfed into its uh, uh, morphological constituents. Alternatively, they may be relying on accessing the full word form served, uh, perhaps without morphological structure. And if that is true, then this can further be explained by uh, assuming that inflectional rules, so rules that map morphosyntax to form, in contrast to derivational rules, may be perhaps less available or more difficultly acquired later in life by late learners, by late bilinguals, possibly, as I've shown you in our AOA study, due to age-related maturational changes. What is interesting about this is that there seems to be a remarkable selectivity of L1 versus L2 differences. In all these studies, we're dealing with the domain of morphology, and we're dealing with very similar stimuli, and we're dealing with a, a, the same task and uh, forms that are superficially very much alike. They differ precisely in the type of morphology that they engage. And so L1, L2 differences appear to be found specifically for morphosyntactic, but not for morpholexical operations, and seem to be these ones particularly affected by age of acquisition. Um, 
this supports accounts that recognize that the linguistic system may be internally differentiated, perhaps between decomposition versus lexical storage, perhaps between inflection and derivation, but accounts that essentially separate different types of morphology would have an advantage explaining these results. And also accounts that postulate some sort of fundamental differences between native speakers and late learners, and that attribute those differences perhaps to the loss of parts uh, of the language acquisition system with increased maturation. Um, at the same time, it is also important to note that what we've been finding in different studies is a certain gradient pattern in which it is not really possible to, to unambiguously claim that certain words are being decomposed and others not, certain conditions are being decomposed and others not, that certain participants are decomposing inflected forms and others not. In fact, it seems that what we are dealing with here is more gradient effects in nature. For example, the later the age of acquisition, the less the priming effect. So if you learn language at 25, then you get less priming effect than if you learned your second language at 18, and you get less priming effect than if you learned your second language at age 10. Also, participants may exhibit more or less priming. If you remember those plots that I've shown for different participants in which we used uh, these models to estimate those effects, it's not the case that we get, say, two groups of participants, some that are native-like and some that are not. In fact, different participants may exhibit more or less priming, and this is also a gradient in fact. And the greater variability in responses also appears to be a matter of degree as revealed by these uh, statistical models. And this presents a very big challenge because we need to account for gradient L1 versus L2 differences. We need to account for amounts of non-native likeness. And also, very fundamentally, we need to account for a gradient morphological structure. It's not enough to just say that some words are decomposed and some are not, that L2 speakers are not decomposing inflected forms and L1 speakers are. It seems that we actually need some sort of theoretical account that is able to accommodate gradient morphological structure with some speakers and some trials actually decomposing words to a certain extent, so to speak. This is a very big challenge because a full account of L2 grammar and processing will require models that accommodate these graded levels, both of non-native likeness and of morphological structure, but at the same time, this full account will need to capture the internal differentiation of the language system and this kind of separation between inflection and derivation. This is not something that we've figured out yet, but that we'll keep working on. Thank you very much. That is all. I'll be glad to answer your questions. Thank you very much, Joao, for a great talk and a very clear and informative presentation. You have uh, about 215 people uh, there listening at the moment, and there are already some questions lined up. So I'm going to read through some of them for you. Um, do you want uh, a moment to uh, catch your breath or take a just drink a little bit of water? water. <laughs> yeah. Um, so the first question is from Pui. Um, can you explain the priming millisecond in Verissimo et al. 2018, the third study you present, what does the priming scale below zero mean? Uh -huh. That's a very good question. <clears throat> um, it, it would seem that we would get some sort of inhibition for very late speakers. Um, and this is maybe not completely crazy. Some empirical studies have shown effects that go on the direction of inhibition for inflectional priming. But at the same time, it would seem that this effect is um, quite extreme. And I would say probably too extreme. So there are two outliers here, two people with very large uh, age of acquisition, uh, 36 and 38. When we redid this analysis without these two participants, we obtained the same effect again, a break point at uh, age five or six, but this regression line actually doesn't become as steep 
another thing I've done here was to then conduct a Bayesian analysis that essentially tries to uh, have, have, have prior expectations on these effects and, say, and says, well, inhibition is a bit weird in such a priming task. Uh, and those kinds of models led to a more accurate picture. At the same time, it does seem that this goes in the direction of inhibition, and uh, that could be explained perhaps by some sort of processing cost uh, that, has, that, that can be associated with the demands of dealing with an inflected form. It could also be that what we are actually seeing here is some sort of Z shape, right? Perhaps we have this breakpoint and then priming goes down, but then it actually stabilizes for the later ages of acquisition. This is actually likely and has been found in a number of age of acquisition studies in other domains. It's just that we don't have enough statistical power here to detect those more complex shapes. Basically, I think this is telling us something about the breakpoint, but I wouldn't bet completely on this very extreme inhibition effect. This probably will not generalize to other studies. Thank you very much, Joao. The next question is from Emma. In the light of the CEFR companion volume updating 2008 that removes any reference to the ghost of idealized native speaker concept proficiency, do you read the L2 morphological processing you're studying in a different way, in a diverse perspective? Wow. Um, um, no, none of these studies, um, are, are, are conducted so much on the basis of proficiency and of um, success, so to speak, in language attainment. So what's important here is that these speakers are actually very proficient speakers and they actually know inflection in their second language. And if you give these speakers these forms, they are perfectly able to understand these forms and to use them in, in language. What matters here is whether there are different routes, so to speak, to obtaining the same results. So if indeed for a late learner, there is an emphasis on lexical access via full storage, then you're basically getting to the same place, which is understanding that surfed is the past tense of surf, but you're doing so via a different mechanism. This does not mean that there is any kind of idealization with regards to the native speaker. The goal of this research is to, if there are indeed such differences between late learners and between native speakers, then we would like to explain them and to understand where they're coming from. But this does not mean that there is any kind of uh, uh, propagation of an idea that there is anything uh, inherently worse about being a, a, a non-native speaker. Great, thanks a lot. Um, the next question from Cecile. What do you think the gradients you observe tells us regarding the distinction between knowledge, competence, and proceduralization? Mm, um, complicated question. Um, some of that, that, that question is often discussed in, in, um, in the syntactic literature and sometimes on the literature even with native speakers and grammaticality judgments with native speakers. Uh, whether when we find graded effects, for example, in judgments, whether in fact we are seeing processing effects, so to speak, or whether in fact this is a reflection of some sort of more gradient grammar. Uh, my impression with regards to these results is that they, it's hard to come up with a processing account that would explain this without appealing to some sort of gradiency in the morphological grammar. That's my impression with regards to these results. This would mean then that uh, this balance between, let's say, knowledge and proceduralization or storage versus decomposition, this balance much must change in a gradient way. And that is the difficulty here. That is, that is the, the true problem. 
So a lot of accounts, including those accounts that postulate fundamental differences between L1 and L2 speakers. Imagine, for example, the shallow structure hypothesis of um, Klassen and Felser. A lot of the current phrasing that they do is essentially there is more or less reliance on certain types of information, on certain uh, levels of representation. So even those accounts that postulated very strong L1 versus L2 differences have essentially been forced to acknowledge that we're dealing with a balance that is less versus more. How to actually formalize this into a specific model? That I don't know yet. Uh, one promising model that I've been working on is this, uh, it's called gradient symbolic computation uh, proposed by Smolensky and also worked on by um, Matt Goldrick. Uh, and essentially they came up with a system and a computational system that is able to represent structure and at the same time that can do so in a graded way and can form different blends of different types of representations. That type of system to me is very promising. This would be the kind of thing that would allow us to have constituent structure and at the same time perhaps formalize what this balance between storage and decomposition or declarative and procedural uh, may actually mean. Well, we look forward to hearing more about that in the near future. <laughs> so several people are asking about the role of the L1. For example, Robert says, excellent keynote, thank you. Does the morphological richness of L1 play a role in inflectional priming effects? Um, So we, have, we haven't done studies comparing groups with different L1s, and so it's um, hard to say. In general, it's hard to conduct those studies and to have two very well-matched groups that then we could uh, test this on. It's important to note that when I'm talking about AOA effects here, for example, this does not mean that there aren't all sorts of other variables that may play a role in morphological priming. Exposure may play a role, proficiency may play a role, the influence of the L1 may play a role. I'm focusing on one type of effect that I think is particularly insightful with regards to how language works, especially in the second language. Uh, but that doesn't mean that is the sole variable that explains the results. It's very likely that the L1 will play a role. I have one study done with a different kind of paradigm, which is uh, generalization of morphology in which I found uh, interesting L2 effects in the generalization of conjugation classes in Portuguese. And another uh, follow-up that I'm doing at the moment is running that same study in a group of Romance speakers. So testing Spanish, Romanian, and Italian speakers that speak Portuguese as an L2 uh, to see if those transfer effects exist. The preliminary results actually suggest that in that particular task, which is different from these ones that I've shown you today, uh, that actually they, they, these transfer effects do not show up. That is, there is a kind of an L2 pattern of processing Portuguese and generalizing Portuguese uh, that seems to be L2 based rather than uh, transfer based. Uh, but this is just one study that I'm working on at the moment. It may very well be the case that this will turn out to play a role. Thank you, Joao. I think we have time for one last question. Um, so Theo says, thanks Joao for this very clear presentation. In the reanalysis of previous studies, you show individual variability for inflection with some L2 learners being primed, others not. Did you observe something similar in the large study with Turkish learners of German, apart from the age of onset effects? Ah, very interesting. Uh, we haven't examined this. So you could think that partly what explains this is indeed some sort of AOA effect. Uh, and so whenever we find this kind of variability, then we could fit statistical models that essentially try to account for this variability. So we could, uh, put different variables in the model and then see if the variability reduces or increases. We haven't actually done that with the AOA study. It was complex enough as it was. 
most likely there is additional variability be what beyond what can be explained by AOA. It's not something that I've tried, but it's a very good idea. I will try that. <laughs>